Welcome to Practical Changemakers, a carbon positive story. I'd like to acknowledge that we're speaking to you today on Wajak Noongar Buja and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Louise Tarrier and I'm the CEO of Carbon Positive Australia. Our mission is to empower and encourage everyone in Australia to take action that revitalises and improves the health of landscapes and communities. We do this via our carefully selected Australian tree planting projects and by providing inspiring education programs. Through our work, we get to talk to and spend time with people who are working for the health of our environment every single day. These practical change makers and leaders don't often make the headlines, but the work that they do is vital in our changing world. It's my pleasure to introduce some of them to you and for you to hear more about their work, to be inspired and to find out ways you can also become a practical change maker. My guest today is Paul Frasca and Paul started his hairdressing career at the age of 11, which is amazing. And he was already a salon owner by the time he was 19, having won prestigious hairdressing awards. He went to Europe where he styled an elite clientele for the next decade. His passion for sustainability started when he lived in Amsterdam and his travels then brought him back to Australia where they researched salon waste and discovered that hairdressers send 1 million kilos of aluminium foils to landfill every year and I'm sure he's going to tell us a little bit more about that um, when we chat. In 2015 um, the pair started an innovative resource recovery program called Sustainable Salons which was designed specifically specifically for the salon environment. Sustainable Salons collects up to 95% of salons waste bin and repurposes it for environmental and community benefit. Paul, it's a really big welcome to you today and I'd love for you to, I've just told everyone a little bit about you, but I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about yourself, your story and you know what spoke to you about sustainability and why you felt it was so important to get involved. Yeah, thank you so much. And firstly, just uh, great to be on your podcast. Uh, we love the work you guys are doing. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. So um, basically, to take you down the hairy world, I guess you could say, of what um, uh, what, what has led, I guess, a hairdresser to now uh, own a, a company with his partner that's now has six depots across Australia and New Zealand and servicing thousands of salons and collecting all their waste. Well, to be honest, I was never uh, actually, uh, uh, everyone always used to think, oh, you must be this big greenie, you know, and you went out and, you know, it, this mattered to you so much. I said, actually, when I started my career, that was not the big focus. I was in fashion shows. I was, you know, everything to me was actually about fashion. And, and, uh, and of course, that led me around the world to do my work. But it's when I actually lived in Amsterdam, and I, to give you that story, I went there for two weeks and stayed eight years. I <laughs> so, love those kind of stories. <laughs> I said, anyone, Amsterdam can do that too, so watch out. Um, so but it was such a beautiful city to live in, by the way. Um, but saying that, it's where I actually met my partner, Evelina. Evelina was actually studying fashion sustainability and uh, and I still remember the first night I met her, you know, at an old-fashioned party, you know, and uh, <laughs> I still remember her standing in the kitchen there and I just had to go talk to her and uh, and we just started chatting and I was like, you know, what are you doing? She's like, fashion sustainability. I'm like, what's that? You know, and she's like, well, I actually study the supply chain of a material. So wow. your top actually comes from somewhere, you know, you don't think much of that because most people would just go order something on Alibaba and make someone in China make it. But you never stop to think, well, where do all these resources actually come from? And when you say resources, I mean like, first let's go right down to the core of just planting the seed for the cotton. Where does the water come from? Where does, who's picking the cotton? And, and so on and so on along the supply chain until how you wear then that, that garment. When she told me this, I couldn't believe how much uh, corruption, how much um, environmental damage was happening in this space. And it, it really woke me up. That was my wake up moment where I thought, wow. And I still remember that, 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 that next day I went back to the hair salon and I looked down going, where does all the hair go? Where does all this aluminium foil go? We foil women's hair all the time. And I, I just couldn't believe that it didn't go anywhere. It, you know, I was just shocked to know that it just goes all to landfill. And then you're like, but why? And I think that's really where it all kick-started. That's when the journey began, where we had to discover where do these materials go now and how can we actually turn them into future resources. And sustainability then became the word that we really levitated towards because it really represents not just about the green, it represents the people, planet and profit with inside that model. 
that you have to actually get really good at. And that's something that cares a lot to us because we care so much about the planet, my partner and I, but we also care a lot about the jobs and how that actually gets created and also how the companies have to profit within that to make it a sustainable business model. So um, I'm sure you might ask some questions then, I'll take you through that, but that's actually how it all began. And I do really love those stories of how people suddenly wake up to things. It's, you know, particularly with waste, you know, we, we put out our waste, don't we? And it's like, it goes somewhere or anywhere. And we don't actually ever think about where that somewhere or that anywhere is and I think when you dig down into supply chains that's that becomes the whole story doesn't it of the supply chain both oh, you know yeah. out and 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 coming in it's you know where are these things created and we don't have that relationship with our products do we that we know you know the lineage of them and where they're coming from and and, and how they've been made and what materials we use who made them even mm. exactly right and 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 to really even the way I kind of even uh, have to answer this to a lot of people because people get upset saying oh brands should know this and I'm like you have to understand it's it's like saying to a hairdresser well you now need to know where all of your products and supplies come from as well it's it's it can be overwhelming there's so much information you have to gather and and a hairdresser just wants to get on with cutting hair you know it's like a product company They're, for them to now understand their whole supply chain they might not be able to get back to the factory that made the product but they don't, they can't go past that because it's, they don't have the resources actually to go in that deep. So the only way I can see out of that supply chain issue is blockchain. You know, blockchain technology is, is, is now is, is here. Um, it is actually a, a digital ledger service, which is going to solve this for brands and consumers of the future. Uh, but that's a whole another conversation. I don't know how deep you want me to get into the blockchain, but um, this is a really exciting next step that we're going to be seeing in the next generation of how to actually understand our assets, our products and our materials, and just about how they all are interlinked to you actually now wearing that garment. And can I also even say when even talking about a garment, you know, when I, I said to someone, you know, that's only three quarters of the problem is where did it come from to you wearing it? We also have to think about then how do you dispose of it? Exactly. Because where does this it go? Life hasn't, it mm. hasn't ended. No. It's still going on. You don't maybe wear it. Yes, you think it's ended. But, you know, that garment, if it had a life, if it, would, if it had a brain, it was it's still moving on its journey into landfill and then trying to degrade itself. And what harm is that doing to our water table? Are those chemicals falling down? into our drinking water. And this is really what people now need to wake up to. And I think as well, the globalization of our supply chains as well, where we're, we're moving and shipping things, aren't we? From, you know, continent to continent for the different processes, because we're yeah. always trying to get the, probably the lowest cost and, and sometimes quality too. So, you know, I don't want to be completely damning on that, but you know, there, yeah. there as is an Italian, element. we do, we do make quality. We used to, I should say. <laughs> exactly. You know? So, you know, there are places, aren't there in the world that are renowned for the quality products that they make. So I, I'm not, but you know, the reality is of how we ship and, you know, the journeys that our products have to go on in order to come to us and, and then after that, when their life ends, you know, the journey, I mean, we were talking with, about recycling and where does recycling end up? You know, it's, a, it's the same kind of conversation, isn't it? It doesn't necessarily end up on our shores here. Uh, I think when you quickly uh, deep dive into anything in, 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 about the, the supply chain, you'll be, if a consumer knew about where their lipstick came from and how it got produced or it's, it's nappies for its baby, it would nearly disgust you. You'd nearly be so gobsmacked to know that it's been traveling, you know, three quarters around the world before it got to you um, and, and the vast amount of carbon emissions that that has created. Yeah, it, it really does put that kind of uh, disgust in you. But, but I do say to people all the time, we've got to just wake up to the reality that we can fix it. This is a very fixable problem. Um, exactly. One of the unique words I use at the moment is called localism, not globalism. And that, that doesn't mean we have to get rid of globalism. It's just how do you bring globalism down to a local level? And and big brands today, because uh, I work a lot, of course, in the hair and beauty industry, we've got big uh, multinational brands that, you know, uh, distribute to the world and they, they're in 100 plus countries. Um, I say to them, it's, it's not about you have to give up your uh, current business model. It's just how do you bring stories now that benefit those communities? 
So, for example, I believe you live in WA, Western Australia. Exactly, we do. People in Western Australia would like to know what benefits are you bringing to your community? Are jobs being created within your community? Um, Are you also recycling as close as possible to where I am, you know, in, in, in the case of recycling? Because this is key to the success of sustainability is how local can you bring that material? And how local can you bring those jobs? Because that's what truly matters to people uh, in their community. It does, exactly. I mean, when they feel that they're getting economic, but also health and well-being benefits from that, because, you know, they're not they're not being subject to, I suppose, climate change impacts are going to happen from from those products traveling so far. I think, you know, people can oh, really huge. see the huge benefits, can't they, for themselves and their families of that of that localization of the supply chain. I think the, the climate issue one is really a, a hard one for everyone to get their head around because, you know, you could. it's like what an Australian would say. It's like, well, what does it matter what I do over here because China is not doing their bit and, and they're, they're sending out vast more carbon emissions and What's the point in us trying to do our bit in Australia when we're just less than 0.01%? I'm like, no, that is not the way we will approach this. I get it that you might not feel the direct impact of that. Well, I can tell you now in New South Wales, we are feeling that, the floods. We're seeing some of the most dramatic, uh, catastrophic flooding we've ever seen. And it really does wake people up because they've never seen that in their lifetime. Their grandparents never saw that in their lifetime. And now it's happening more regularly than ever before and it's hitting our doorstep and i say to you now you're waking up because you're finally seeing it with your eyes but how do we wake you up prior to that we can we can actually listen to science we can actually listen to the experts and actually trust them along their journey even if they get something wrong along their journey i do believe that they are doing the right thing by actually giving us the best data the best information to make really uh what i see is very simple decisions but in a, in, a, in, a, in a political environment, they're, high, they're quite complex. Exactly. And I think, you know, climate lead, at the, you know, we hear these words all the time. So climate leadership is what's actually needed in this moment. And, you know, and I, I really want you to talk about because you've actually shown that climate leadership through the work oh, yeah. that you're doing. Um, so just, yeah, please tell us a little bit more about how your industry in particular can play a really positive role in sustainability. Yeah, definitely. And if I could actually start here with that word, least like like uh, leadership, really. Uh, people ask me all the time, "What do you expect of your your leaders?" And I say, "Well, who do you think my leaders are?" And then they say, "Well, the politicians." And I say, "Well, uh, you're talking to the wrong person because uh, I don't believe they're my leaders. Um, uh, what I believe as my leaders are, are true leaders in in a space, especially in sustainability." So let me give an example of that. Mm, when you talk of people like Elon Musk, that's a leader to me. That's someone who's who's not waiting for government to make decisions. They're building the infrastructure that's necessary to just give the consumer exactly what they want. And that's what's going to drive change much faster than any government could ever move at. Because as a, as a, as a business person, you have to actually first build a product that the customer wants. So he's betting all of his money that the customer is actually going to buy his Tesla car. It's as simple as that. Now, when you have to take that challenge on and shift a whole petroleum industry, shift a whole car manufacturing industry at the same time, this is what we see as true leadership. Now, I, I'm also seeing in Western Australia with Twiggy Forest at the moment, you know, in what he's trying to achieve with the mining industry to decarbonize it, to bring green hydrogen into the space, I see leadership. Um, yes, he's had a, 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 a maybe a dirty business for, for some time, but again, he grew up at a time where he, hadn't, he didn't need to focus on the environment. Now that it's come to him, he's seen the science, he's seen the data, he now wants to be on the right side of history. He wants to build the future of energy within the country. And you know what? It's great for business. It's great for jobs. It's amazing for our environment. So that's people, planet and profit. That's what I really like to stand behind. So I really always like to map that out. What is a leader to me? Because I very rarely see that in politicians. Um, politicians have a very tough job because they ultimately have to just please their voters. And in that space, well, you don't ever kind of get your own voice. So when you see a politician, you gotta always remember it's not their voice. They're just speaking where the votes are taking them. Just like a business leader will usually do where the money goes, they'll go. But true leaders, they don't 
simply stand behind money, they stand behind values. And they're selling values like never before. And they're some of the greatest leaders to me today. And I just, I just can't get enough of it, to be honest, because there's a consumer waiting for them. And all you've got to do, and I say this to young university kids now, is you need to build those products because the consumer is actually just waiting. So let me paint a picture of sustainable salons and that might yes, explain please a bit of do, because where I we're think, going. Yeah. I think that would be really good. And I I just want to add in just one thing as well. I think, you know, for me one of the one of the problems with the political side is the short term nature of what they do because of the voting cycles and all of those kind of things. So I'd really one of the things we're interested in, in as an organisation is how do we build legacy? How do we build over time as well, you know, and take a more long-term view? So I'd really love if you can put that element in as well into what you're doing, because yeah. I'm well, sure that's well, really to, deeply there. To, to simply put it, be... Everything we do has an impact, from how we commute to work to what we buy at the grocery store. Our lifestyle choices are contributing to our carbon footprint. Did you know Australians have one of the highest personal carbon footprints in the world? The good news is we can change that. Measuring your footprint is easy with our Carbon Footprint Calculator. Custom designed for Australians, it gives you an accurate footprint calculation so you can really know your number. You'll also learn practical everyday ways to reduce and offset the impact of your lifestyle to help combat climate change. You can calculate your footprint at carbonpositiveaustralia.org.au forward slash calculate. For over 21 years, Carbon Positive Australia has planted trees and sequestered carbon. Our tree planting increases canopy cover and biodiversity and also creates positive climate health and wellbeing outcomes. We take a nature-led approach and are passionate about providing ecologically sensitive planting that protects our environment. We only plant biodiverse native species and specialise in working with landholders to create innovative solutions for carbon planting. We are renowned for our research and monitoring of ecological outcomes. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you can plant trees with us by donating at carbonpositiveaustralia.org.au forward slash donate. Well, fashion's the easy part. Try to support, try to build a supply chain that is actually benefiting the planet is key. Trying to then truly understand your customer and their needs is going to be key. Trying to look at how you can produce that garment locally is key because people love hearing about a story about it being produced in their local backyard and all of these things that matter so much to people's choices today why they purchase things. And you know what? You don't even have to probably worry too much about the profit part because the client's waiting. They're actually waiting for you. They're not waiting for the other things that are coming, they're actually waiting for you. And I always say this, and I'll give an example with sustainable salons Please. now. Yeah. So, so what is sustainable salons? Um, we're basically essentially a comprehensive resource recovery service. We're designed specifically for the salon environment. We reward our members for being part of our program. And everything that we collect out of salons, so all those materials, they then get redirected back into local communities and charitable programs to solve social and local issues. So let me unpack that a little bit. Yes, please do. So the first I think... part, comprehensive resource recovery service. Yep. We provide a, a, a six to eight bin infrastructure that goes inside a salon. So we actually separate everything from chemical waste, hair clippings, plastics, metals, so on and so on. Um, all of that infrastructure comes into the salon. We then have drivers that go to the door of these salons right across Australia and New Zealand every fortnight to collect those materials. They get redirected back to one of our depots, one of our six depots, uh, where it then gets processed. So those materials have to go through a second level of processing, just where we can, you know, sometimes have to get the bobby pins out of the hair, or we've got to get, there's still some micro things that, you know, can't be 100% perfect. So we then go through that process. Then those material lines go off through their recycling or upcycling or even downcycling processes that need to happen, which I can explain in just a second. So there's the comprehensive part. What, what makes us different than a yellow bin? Well, in itself is we actually do all the processing in the salon environment before it comes to us first. That's key. We don't just shove it all into one bin, like a yellow bin, and, and what I call wish, wish recycle yeah. and hope that it ends up somewhere. And the best part is because we control from end to end, our, our, we control the bins that go in the salon, we, we control our depots, 
we and we know who all of our recyclers are, we can actually give transparency along our route. So if any consumer wanted to know where their bottle's going, where their hair's going, whatever's happening, we can actually give you that answer in, in, in rapid speed. That's where another amazing. company would be like, oh, okay, we don't know, where do you live? Um, that they don't know because it's it's going through a highly complex MRF, which is of course there's no they they couldn't guarantee any any uh, information on your material because again it's all mixed in there's no there's no blockchain on that material so that makes us really special I think in that space so Salon's like signing up to us because we can offer them the most comprehensive recycling service in the country and just to answer that one more part of comprehensive is if you gave a hair salon for example a yellow bin only less than 15% of what comes out of a hair salon can actually go in a yellow bin. Yeah, it's quite restrictive, isn't it, what goes in the yellow bin? Well, 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 think about it. It was actually designed not for small business. It was actually designed for residential. Yeah. And it was just put onto small business. So if you're a fish and chip shop owner, you own a shoe shop, or you own any pretty much small business cafe, the yellow bin is technically useless to you because they're not your core materials that come out. So in a hair salon, you know, it, when you look at 15% of your waste is hair, well, where does that go? And then you've got another about 25%, which is plastic. Where does all that go? You know, none of those materials can go in a yellow bin. Uh, the only thing that could go in there is paper and cardboard. So, and then I've got chemical waste, I've got ponytails, all these things that are highly specific. So that's the key to being super specific with the recycling. Then we have this uh, uh, also part where we say we only service five key industries, so that's hair, beauty, uh, dermal clinics, barber shops, and dog groomers. That's all we service. We don't go outside of that. We don't do cafes. We don't do uh, tattoo parlors. They all call us. We say no, because we have to master these industries. So you because know really fun. well what you do. You've mastered your area, definitely. We, yeah. we, we, it's, there's so many businesses that we have to focus on here. This will take me probably my lifetime to get right. So. Everyone, I would say, don't be general, be specific and get really tight on your messaging so you can really solve their problems because that's what's going to make that customer uh, relationship that you have with your customer really tight. They're going to they're gonna know you can talk their language. Yep. You know what I mean? That's super important. So then uh, we like to explain that we actually reward our members for being part of our program. Why? Because this is what it's all about. You've taken on this uh, amazing concept that we've given now we're going to give you things back, which are your own waste. So we actually now manufacture, so uh, uh, no one, you know, because you're only listening to my voice, but I'm wearing a pair of glasses right now that are made from shampoo bottles. Uh, you know, we've got combs, coasters, we've got pots, we've got a whole range of items made from your plastic. So that, that, that's just plastic and I'll move on to some other items, human hair. We manufacture product lines out of human hair. We've got things called hair booms that soak up oil spills. We've even got a new product coming out. Which oh, tell is us more about the hair booms, please. Uh, I, I'd love to hear. I, I just having this because con- you know you go to the salon, don't you? And you watch your hair fall on the floor, and it's a bit like, oh my god, my hair's coming off. Yeah. And I, ne- <laughs> I never really think, you know, probably like most people, it's on the floor. You sweep it up. I'm assuming actually it's probably going into a compost area or something like that. No. But maybe. So to find out that it goes on a boom, I'd love to find out more about that. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Tell me. Yeah, well, it, it's quite fascinating. I always say to someone, if you think of a sheep 200 years ago and, and, and uh, us humans are going to that sheep, we're like, what are we going to do with this sheep? And, uh, 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 and most people back then would have been like, eat that meat, you know, <laughs> chop it up, kill it, eat it. There's far more money today in selling hug boots than there is killing the sheep. That's the truth. (laughs) And and that wool is no different than what's on your head because your wool, which is your hair, is a keratin base and it's just pretty much identical uh, when you break it down. So actually what we've realised is, well, if we've got hair growing on our heads, why can't we see this as a future resource? Now, all we've got to figure out is, okay, people maybe don't want to wear hairy Ugg boots. Got it. Possibly (laughs) not. It might freak them out. But you never know in the future. We never thought we were going to take the wool off a sheep and put it in our shoes and and today we do that but basically what's what's happening with human hair is we're just actually breaking down to say okay what is human hair we did this at UTS University we first studied it then we realized basically that human hair is actually really good absorbent for oil Um, so let me give an example when you put shampoo on your head you're taking off the oil right because your oil is stuck to your hair it's like glue you can't you could put 
water on it all day long and try to wash it out. It won't come out. You have to put a sulfate on your hair to wash it out. So what we're doing is now realizing, wait a second, why don't we just get good dry hair and just put it on oil and start to see what happens. And you know what happened? It sucks it up like a magnet. It's instant and it, and it locks to the cuticles. And you're like, wow, hair and oil are like a match made in heaven. Maybe not for our head, but for an oil spill, it works really well. So we've then developed a product called a hair boom that basically can go out and clean up oil spills. And you'll really like this That's story. That's fantastic. Only, I love that. Only just, uh, yeah, only just uh, six months ago, we cleaned up a big oil spill in WA. Um, so at Kirkalocka Station, which is about a seven to eight hour drive outside of Perth, uh, they had an oil tanker that flipped over and oil went all through uh, their rivers. Um, actually, all of our network of salons in WA started texting us saying, you know, can sustainable salons support Kirkalocka Station? Uh, five days later, we had 1,200 booms delivered to that remote station where they could then actively get out to help clean up their oil spill because no one was coming to clean it up. Um, so this is what we're trying to represent is people power would not only with your resource uh, showing that it can actually go out and do a job where we would normally have purchased a product from Germany or around the world to come and do something which we could have done locally with our own resources. I would never, you know, in a million years would I have ever thought that you were going to tell me that today. That's just blown my mind. I mean, the fact that, yeah, we're using our hair to actually help clean up oil spills. I mean, just, yeah. Well, let me give you another really interesting one about hair is we're the world's biggest donor of hair to the medical wig market. So we supply, uh, we've collected, I should say, over 200,000 ponytails for our network. Same resource, just longer, not shorter, right, as a, as a yep. ponytail is. And uh, we supply those ponytails into the medical wig market for children with alopecia cancer uh, to actually bring down the cost of a wig because hair, when it's long, is actually quite valuable. That hair is actually more like a hair extension hair. It yep. is actually, uh, it's, yeah, from it's, it's an extremely valuable uh, commodity. Uh, and the problem with what happened with hair extensions is uh, 20 years ago when I call it the Paris Hilton problem, <laughs> when Paris Hilton started showing up for hair extensions, every girl, every 14 year old girl in the world wanted hair extensions. And it actually then shifted all the hair that was needed for medical wigs into the commercial market and then a wig that would normally cost $2,000 went to $20,000 overnight. Wow, that's incredible. And so we've helped now support the medical wig market by actually supplying all the hair. And the best part is it's all ethical. That's Prior to us, all of that hair would have been cut off probably in India under the illusion that it was going to certain gods and, and it was a black market of people shaving women's hair in 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 in, um, in, uh, in, in uh, centers where they would basically yeah be told that their hair is going to a certain god but basically they were just getting paid a few dollars for their hair and then sold on the open market for thousands of dollars so it's a real shame because hair, these markets just need to be fixed and you know what hair grows on our heads it just couldn't be more sustainable. It's a renewable it resource, isn't it? If ever there was one, I know. I have to keep going to the hairdressers to have mine, have mine cut off. So. Can I give you a funny fact here? I still remember chatting with the guys in Sydney at the Sustainable Institute, and they said to me, I can't believe you found a new resource uh, because, you know, for years we never find new resources because, you know, we think we know them all. And this one's actually growing on our heads. <laughs> it's, yeah, so obviously there, isn't it? So obviously on our heads. So I just want to kind of turn the, turn the questions a little bit and just say, look, you know, listeners are uh, hearing this and thinking, well, that's really great. So how how do I find a sustainable hair salon? How do I go, you know, how do I choose somewhere that actually is undertaking these type of practices? What's the best way of finding them? Oh, really easy. So uh, basically uh, on our website at sustainablesalons.org, uh, you can go on there. We have a directory to our uh, 1,400 plus members on the program across Australia and, you, and New Zealand, and you can actually find your local sustainable salon and uh, basically, yeah, go and support them, uh, show your support. Uh, we've recently just become the number one directory service in Australia and New Zealand for consumers looking to get their hair done. So that's really exciting. And again, um, I, I always like to say this, if you build it, they will come. There's a community right now looking to support their values. They're looking for businesses. And what I like to call this, they're voting with their dollar in their, in their local community. Yes. People are wanting to support that butcher more than ever. 
They want to support that greengrocer more than ever because they don't want to see all these great small businesses disappearing. People are really fighting back with their dollar and a sustainable salon is no different. We're seeing so many consumers now saying, you know what? I want to know my hair is going off to clean up at Oswald. I want to know my foils, which I never mentioned to you. Oh, we please, sell off yes, the talk about the foils. Tell us a little bit about oh, those, because uh, as someone story. who has has to have foils on a regular basis just to cover up the grey, I would love to oh. find out. Well, this is, this is a very simple one. Foil actually is infinitely recyclable. So you can melt aluminium foil a million times over and it'll never lose its properties. Um, like gold and silver, it's an amazing resource. Uh, yet we were throwing a million kilos to landfill yearly. So what all we did was is actually start to collect that aluminium and then we started to sell it on the open market. So it's a commodity, you sell it at around about 15 to a dollar a kilo, uh, 15 cents to a dollar a kilo. And basically we would sell it, uh, which guaranteed it to be recycled. Because of course, I always tell everyone, if someone's buying it off you, uh, they either have a really bad business model <laughs> yeah. or, or it's definitely off to where it needs to go. Then we use all those profits, 100% of those profits go to Oz Harvest and Kiwi Harvest, uh, where Oz Harvest and Kiwi Harvest are basically the organisation that rescue food to give back to our most hungry Australians and New Zealanders. They provide millions and millions of meals to the homeless each year and we support them by, uh, we've now uh, clocked out of nearly 208,000 meals have been provided by selling off the aluminium foil within hair salons. And again, what a simple story, just like you're telling me, you get your hair foil, wouldn't you like to know that your waste is actually benefiting the community? Yes, it's rather going than going back. into landfill. You know, because right? Not only we're recycling it, we're giving the proceeds yeah. of those recycling back into help feeding the homeless, this is what business models have to be of the future. We have to think, yes, you know, because people ask us, but how do we make money? Or how does it our program work? So I say, well, our clients actually pay for our service. Like a hair salon is like, I want this in my business because it attracts not only the right clients that I want, it, it's my values too. And actually, this is where I want it to go. Because I, I would always say to someone, what does a yellow bin do for your business? Yeah. It's, it's a really good. And I think one of the, you know, one of the sort of kickbacks that we quite often get when we talk to people about sustainability is, oh, the cost, the cost. You know, people are talking about, oh, it's going to cost too much money to be. But, you know, as you're clearly demonstrating, the benefits are so much outweighing the cost of what you what you're doing. I don't think Elon Musk is worrying about money. Um, I, I tell people all today, uh, again, back to the Elon Musk and Tesla story, because it's like when you build something so great that benefits the planet, is giving jobs back to the community, it's going to be a valued product where consumers are willing to spend more to buy that. You know, he, he, Tesla has become the most valuable car company in the world, not because it built a car. The car is the least of his problems. What he needed to sell was the vision. So what we're doing is giving salons their values so they can sell their vision and the consumer, just like yourself, will be looking out for that because you'll be like, that matters to me. And you know what? I want to support that in my community. And the more we all do that, well, where do you think now the money flows? It's flowing. And I, I gave an example to someone just the other day. I said, if you walk now down the street, you see two cafes. You've got one that's all about organic, localism, you know, coffee that's come from a local roaster. You've got, you know, you've got the eggs that have come from the local farm. Then you've got the other cafe on the other side who's all about cheap. And he's like, you know what? I'll just do the cheap bacon and eggs, the cheap baked beans and all that. It's amazing where all the customers are now going. I said to someone the other day, what do you spend for breakfast today? They're like, oh man, breakfast costs you about 30 bucks now. It's like dinner. And I'm like, but I, and you say to them, well, did, did you make like, oh no, it's delicious. Have you seen it? It's all about this and organic coffee. People are ready to spend because we're delivering it in a way that they want it. And that's all that has to change now. Because if you're the business on the other side who's cheap, 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 and you know, you're thinking your client doesn't care, well, I can tell you now, I think the market has changed. Yeah, and I think there is an element as well, even if you're sort of living, uh, you know, with limited resources, I suppose, at the end of the day, if you're thinking about how your sustainable journey is, I think you're more likely to forego other things, aren't you, to, to move towards things that, that fit your values. And, and you're often saving in so many other ways. Now, of course, we're talking from a privileged oh. perspective here, you know, for some people that really isn't, you know, a reality. So I just want to make yes. that clear. But, you know, for your average sort of working Australian with a reasonably good job, you know, that 
there are ways in which, you know, you can make choices that actually overall, although you're making more sustainable choices, will save you money in the longer term. Oh, and, and, and even to talk on that privilege part for a second, we've actually re- even run data to find out actually people with less money are willing to spend more for values than people with money. You'd be surprised. People actually with money, it's nearly the opposite. They become protective. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, it's a reverse, yeah. So yeah. if you ever meet a, a, a poorer community, they tend to have a lot of big smiles on their faces and they're always wanting to support their community. It's always about, look, if I've got food, you're going to have food. If I've got something to drink tonight, you're going to have something to drink tonight. The richer you get, the more protective you get. And and that's actually a real problem because actually the people with money should be the ones actually realising that they can make a huge difference in helping to bring up those communities financially. So I definitely think uh, that there's a lot to learn within those uh, 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 communities because, uh, again, values mean everything. Community means everything. And uh, to be honest, I've got a lot of hope because I speak now to a lot of young kids in university uh, and we, we deliver a lot of our program into schools where the girls cut their hair off, um, where you see all those ponytails being cut off. And when you hear the next generation, all I say to everyone is watch out. They are locked and loaded because they have studied sustainability. Yes, so we're gener- generations that we didn't get taught it. I never got taught it in school. Um, you know, I'm 40 years old. Uh, and when I look back and I'm like, wait, we, you know, sustainability really only came into vogue about 10 years ago. Um, and it's only really made traction in the last two to three years. So it's, it's outpacing the words like green and organic and all that because it actually represents the future of business and the future of resources. And it's not just locking it into just one niche um, thing like organic where, you know, it got washed very quickly. So this is a really exciting time because the kids now know what it means. We'll wait till you see the products and businesses that they're going to start to produce because they're, they're the ones now, we did an interesting study recently is talking to the next people that come onto our program and they're actually a lot of mums now. And they, they say to us, you know, it, very similar to what I said earlier, they're like, I, I wasn't a green person, but my kids now come home from school. They're like, mum, put it in the right bin. Like, <laughs> mum, don't you care about the koalas, mum? And it's just like, mums are just like, I don't want to be on the wrong side of history. Like, I want to be a mother to my kids that was not like my mother where, you know, she didn't care about all this great knowledge, but I want to, like this knowledge that they're bringing home, I believe it, you know what? I need to start living it too. And they're doing it now for their kids. We're hearing this more than ever. I, I just find it amazing, to be honest. Yeah. And, and I, I just love how kids are influencing their parents now and, and it's working and we're seeing a real shift. Yeah, I think, you know, certainly, you know, when you talk about climate leadership, it is our young people that are providing that leadership. You know, we talked earlier, didn't we, about the concept of leadership and you can certainly oh, yeah. see that leadership coming from our younger younger people. Paul, it's been an amazing time chatting to you today. I've, I've learned things that I had no idea about. And I think, you know, it's certainly on a personal level, I'll be making sure that my hairdresser is part of the sustainable salons. Um, yeah. Um, nice recycling program and I just wanted to just before we sort of close just you know what are what are your plans for the rest of 2022 do you have any sort of big plans as an organization to to do more in the organization I was going to say personal plans well, a girl either. The way. um <laughs> little baby girl um oh congratulations um, thank you um but within the organization um that's a bit to be honest we we're, we, we got a lot going at once. One of the really exciting projects we've got right now happening is we've partnered with the Department of Primary Industries um, to uh, build a, uh, it's, it's a green hydrogen uh, hairdressing vehicle that's actually traveling all around uh, New South Wales at the moment to the different um, uh, country festivals to help uh, educate people about how the transition of, from diesel now to green hydrogen. So that's a really exciting thing to look out for. It's called H2 Cuts, if you want to look it up. Wonderful. Uh, it's, already, it's already in full operation and out and about, so you can get a free haircut and learn about green hydrogen. Um, we also have a lot happening in our closed-loop manufacturing space. Um, we're really ramping up a lot of our product lines. Um, we really want our brands and companies now to come towards us and say, what do you want to make? We're here in Australia. You can get sunglasses made in New South Wales by the same waste from New South Wales and you can sell it in New South Wales, right? That's what we're trying to say to people is it can happen in just your state. And and that's what's exciting now. Um, uh, So we're going to see a lot happening there. And to be honest, I think one of the biggest things that we're doing internally is we are now opening up our regional recycling program. 
uh, which is going with great success at the moment, where you can now sign up to sustainable salons anywhere in Australia now. Um, pretty much you could be in the middle of the outback and you can now come on our program um, and uh, it, it's uh, it's going really well. So if, if you're listening and you've got a salon in Karatha, give us a call. Brilliant. Thanks, Paul, so much. I'm sure that our listeners have learned a huge amount today from you. And, you know, I think the leadership that your organisation is showing in your space is just amazing. So thank you so thank much you for so talking much. to us today. Thanks for having me.